Moto America fans, it's time for another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you may even learn something from this unlikely pair and their special guest. The mic is yours, Paul and Sean. Hey, Moto America fans, welcome to another edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. That's Carruthers, I'm Bice, and we have another special video version of our podcast today with uh, a legend in our, our uh, racing realm, um, a, a guy who won championships in the U.S. on the world level in in uh, wor- the world championship and also in the world level in world superbikes. So we welcome John Kaczynski with us here. And good to see you, John. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, having me here on, too. And I must say it's an honor to be here back here at the Sega uh, after so many years away. It feels great. It's just wonderful to see all the people and, and uh, some of the guys that are still doing mechanicing for different teams um, and we're still here from back when I was here so it's amazing to see you again just a great atmosphere now you have you, you have good memories from here and bad memories from here but we'll focus on the good ones but I think I don't know that there's anybody else that's won a 250 GP and a 500 GP at Laguna and Superbike well, and, and World Superbike yeah, I didn't even think about that but was that I mean the 250 GP was obviously huge because it was one of your first ones and then the 500 GP was huge because I, I believe it was first Kajiva's Kajiva's first dry race win and the fact that it was at the US GP was, is, that, is that one of the bigger <coughs> highlights of your career? first of all uh, I would like to correct you on one thing, and that is not all, my mem- all my memories here are good memories. I don't ever recall having a bad memory here, uh, other than the fact in 91 that I fell down in the race. Um, but uh, this track has always been very good to me. Uh, I always thought the walls here were my friends, and I never, you know, I always felt very comfortable and, and loved being here, and loved racing, and even. When I hear the bikes out today, I would like to just get on one and go around the track, you know, because I, I know it would be a lot of fun. Um, but to answer the second part of your question, um, to be able to win here on all the different bikes, and even like the Honda, um, Honda had never won a World Superbike race um, at this track, and they always struggled a lot. So to come here and win both rounds, was it was a big thing as well, but um, just winning here in general was it's had so much pressure to win here, uh, and I felt like if I didn't win, I would just let the whole world down. So there was always a lot on the line every time that I came to the USA Cup. It was always very rewarding, and uh, it's one of my favorite tracks in the world. Yeah, I mean, you won you won the two hundred and fifty race in nineteen eighty nine. And then you you and you weren't in the world championship that year, and then you went in 1990 and won it when you were on Team Marlboro Roberts at that time and that was the year of your championship so that was the 89 it's funny about the 89 season because uh, I'd won the first round in Suzuka and I think the second round was here uh, but I was like right up in the points uh, top three in the points in the championship uh, but of course I was just doing those two rounds but I got two wins mm-hmm. um, but uh, but yeah it was it was good uh, you know practice to uh, just preparation and uh, just you know coming from a US level or even any sort of national level there's many countries you know, when you step up to that world plate it's a big step a big step a lot of changes uh, uh, the competition is I mean, you have essentially everybody out there is at the same talent level everybody wants to win is at the same level like you do and it comes down to the fine details uh, in everybody's program and sometimes programs will have little weak links and that's what uh, you know, keeps them from winning but it's just so competitive in uh, all the different languages and countries and things like that but uh, you know, I'm I, I feel very blessed. I, I look back now and thought, wow, man, I, I live life. Mm. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, you know, all different kinds of series and makes. Uh, 1990. Talk about 1990 a little bit because you won the 250 World Championship. But you actually raced in four <coughs> championships that year. You raced a 500 at uh, Belgium, right? Belgium, Belgium Grand Prix? <coughs> Belgium was uh, the first time I rode a 500. That was in 89. Was that wet? Right? <laughs> and that, the crazy thing about Belgium was, first of all, Frankershamps is a racetrack that 
scare most people to death. It was <laughs> a wonderful place, and, I, and it's somewhere that if I have a chance, I want to go back to it uh, with this new project that I'm building uh, to ride Franker Shafts because it's uh, there's nothing like it in the world. Uh, but during that time, it was the first time to ride a 500, and <laughs> actually, when the race started, it was in the dry, and I was, I believe it was about like fourth or fifth place, and then somebody fell down, and they were going to red flag it, and, and McDoin ran into the back of me, and he flipped his bike up in the handlebar, got caught in a seat, so I went down and crashed. Wow. So I couldn't make the restart, I only had one bike because I was just there for the one race. So Kenny grabbed Kevin McGee's bike. It had upside down forks on it. And you know, I was just riding with conventional style forks. Everything was different. Um, wasn't set up for me or anything. Then it started raining and I jumped on McGee's bike and finished third or second in the race. And uh, that was... Uh, it that's was when you're like, oh, I can do this. Well, I tell you the craziest thing was <clears throat> after Eau Rouge, which is down the front straight and that, that fast S spin up the hill, the spray was so bad and, and, and I just remember at the end of that straight I looked up and I thought man there's no way that can't be Eddie Lawson and it was <laughs> and I remember passing Eddie and I thought wow you know like I didn't, it's like a strange it's like wow am I supposed to be doing this <laughs> you know like you know because I mean I always Eddie somebody I looked up to as a kid racing and you know like man I'm gonna pass this guy this guy's probably not gonna like me anymore you know? <laughs> but I just rode as well as I could, and and, uh, and it was cool to get up on that podium. Yeah, you know, especially with me. that was a huge thing because you know? the 500s back then that's a, was a big jump, you know, to come from anything, uh, whether it had been a 250 or a super bike. Those things were they're pretty gnarly. Mm -hmm. But a ride one, especially in those tricky conditions and everything, but it yeah. was it was it felt great. It was no problem. You know we're. I tend to jump around a little bit, so that's okay. Eighty nine, not you know. You, we talked about you won here um, on a two fifty, but at you won Daytona on a, the six hundred Super Sport race on it. I think it was an FCR six hundred. It was the debut of that bike in eighty nine, I believe. Yeah, Yamaha. <clears throat> they came out with that new bike, and they wanted you know Daytona was always the, and not just eighty nine, but I think but most of the years, right? Where they have, have their new six hundred. It was a big. Yeah. It was a big thing for all the factories, whether it was a six hundred or seven fifty. They always would. That race would push sales big for the year, and Yamaha come out with that 600, and, and, and uh, they hired a few guys to, to ride it. Uh, and uh, I know I think Rob Muzzy was the one that yeah. took care of the Yamahas, and, and it was it was fun. You know, Rob was a funny guy. It was, <laughs> it was interesting. You know, he, I enjoyed that part. But yeah, winning. Uh, From way back, you were pretty far back in the field, yeah, right? They, <clears throat> someone said he jumped to start. I don't believe that was the case, but it didn't matter. <clears throat> That's what happened. They put me in the second wave. So I wasn't on the last row. I was in the second wave. So that was, I knew I had my work cut out. Yeah. But I knew I could do it. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing to get from where you were and to do that for essentially that bike that became iconic for a 600 and the 250 when you won in 1990, the championship for Yamaha. I mean, Yamaha in Japan made a street version of your bike out of that championship. I mean, obviously it was different, but it was a V-twin two-stroke engine and everything because you won that championship and they had it kind of the colors with the green plate on the front of it and everything. So, well, the biggest thing about the 1990 championship is... <clears throat> I think I'm the I'm the second rider, uh, besides Kenny, to ever go to Europe that the first try I'd never seen any of the racetracks and win the championship. Right, that's a big thing. That's you know it's and the, even today you look at guys and you think who could do that now? Right. Oh yeah, totally. You know it, it's and, it, and it's not like you know and, I, and when I hear people talk about that the greatest of all time. I don't believe in that. There is no such thing as the greatest of all time. It doesn't matter about people with race wins, in my opinion. Everyone, anyone who's won a championship, no matter what class it is, maybe, you know, a lot of riders, I should say, only stay in something for a short period of time. But that doesn't make them less great than somebody who stayed in a long time and won more races. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's you look back then versus now it's not like it's any different right it's still very competitive a lot of people want to win but 
and it's pretty and it's like wow look right now about how to do that you know it was and, and plus two being either australian or american where you really have to pack up your whole life and move over there and that's a huge change right and it, it will collapse a lot of people a lot of people just can't emotionally and mentally deal with that part and, and we're not talking about the competition having to get out there at yeah, just right. the life part. <clears throat> right at this level that's that's beyond anything you've ever done. Right. Yeah. So that that was a special. Do you follow the racing now, MotoGP and stuff? Uh, yes, I I follow it through uh, through the internet, and, and uh, I try to keep up. With it. What do you think of what we're about Moto America and what we're doing? I mean, we we've talked a little bit. I mean, you mentioned something about riding a a two cylinder bike in Twins Cup, but it would be a little bit of a different twin cylinder. Wait, tell, tell us about what you're thinking well, there a little bit. You know, for me, you look at just how it's what I re- reference the Millennium Society in general, you know, and when you look at the world, you know, it's like freedom of speech. Is, it's like there's this attack on it where everybody's like narrowed down. And, you know, if you say the wrong thing, you know, people just, you, know, you look out at the world politics, we just get careers ruined. Yes. And... Everything is, and I've never been the type of person that likes parameters at all. You know, I'll decide my own parameters. You know, not somebody's gonna say, "Oh, you can only move in this small little area." Um, so, my first thought was, you can imagine all the six fifty twins and the sound they make. All of a sudden, this radical two stroke come blazing past. I mean. It's just, I know it would, people, the sound alone would just blow people away. Um, and so you do things like that, you know, the intention is to sort of give something special to the fans that they're just not prepared to receive that day. Would you do it, John? I hope, yeah, I would do it. God, it would be great to have John Kuczynski and Moto America racing in our Twins Cup class on a, on a TZ250. I mean, that would be, that would be quite an incredible thing. We would, we would welcome <laughs> that for sure. So. I'm, I'm sure Chuck would approve it. Oh, I think, I think they would make, figure out how to make that happen. So yeah, that would be um, pretty cool. Yeah. That'd be something, you know. Um, you talk about parameters a little bit, and th- this is a parameter. The year '97, when you won your your World Superbike Championship on a, a Castrol Honda, and uh, great season for you. You had your teammate Aaron Slight was there. There's there's always been tales told about the final round. You had clinched the championship, but you know, Aaron Slight, whether Honda wanted this or not, the idea of Aaron Slight. <laughs> finishing winning the race would have put him second in the championship you want to win races you were there to win races he you ended up getting past him he, he finished third in the championship at the end of the year i heard i didn't go over very well with aaron nor did it with honda but you won the race and that's what they wanted you to do so tell us about that whole thing and the parameters that they put on you of like okay you've won the championship but we want our other guy to be second and you're like i don't care about that right i see all the all the viewers now I'd like to ask them the question, who finished third in the 97 World Superbike Championship? And probably <laughs> most people won't know the answer. <laughs> um, but the most important thing is, is is people don't understand behind the scenes what goes on, you know, from like at HRC, uh, Mr. Kanazawa, who was in charge of HRC at that time. And he's the reason that I went to Honda. Uh, and he was very influential in everything during that season. For me, even though he was in Japan, I had direct contact with him uh, at all times. So, and most people from the outside just see the, you know, the, the paddock area and see the people and they, they don't know. But Honda, they wanted to win races. They wanted to win, period. And they paid me very good money to win individual races. Um, so that's what I was there for. And the fact uh, to be and, and to to add more to what you just said, even if he would have finished in front of me in the first race, he completely fell apart in the second race, which he would have lost it anyway. So, uh, <clears throat> um, look, all I can say, they pay me to go and win, and I tried to do that for them, and I did. So there's really not much more to say about it. I mean, I mean he he could have. Um, taking charge of his own situation perhaps a little a little better and he would have been second anyway mm-hmm. so he was in charge of it he was in control of his destiny at, 
the way you feel it and you're in control of your own destiny and you want to win the, win the race when you go out there exactly. yeah so team orders have team orders been presented to you in the past several times in your career and how have you felt about that if they have been um no that year in 97 there were no no team orders okay never someone said you know let this guy finish in front anything like that or nothing so I don't think it's ever ever happened okay I mean people anytime a race goes down to a championship and there's two guys on the team people automatically assume oh there's going to be team orders or somebody's going to tell him and, and even if nobody told them and, and it happens the way it's not supposed to people will just make up stories oh he didn't follow the team orders right. but but it, it, it's, it's journalists, like, isn't it? Maybe it's journalists and fans that think that those yeah. things are, you know, happening. Yeah, a lot of it. They just automatically that. assume that, and they start, you know, maybe start saying negative things about the, the guy who won. They don't know all the conditions. Right. They don't know all the behind the scenes conditions that perhaps the high up people, you know, are the ones telling them, you know, how to do or what he should do or. And yeah, so and if I let that guy win, he's still going to pay me the first place bonus. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what right. they did. They were they were they were really good to me, Honda. They, they that year was, and I tell you, I look back, and I I should have stayed. I should have stayed and never went back to the five hundred. Oh, you should have stayed in World Superbike. Yeah. But you're a two stroke. Well, then no, it was I know. Two -stroke, but I tell you, Honda. But the thing. Yeah. The reason I didn't stay is because Mr. Kanazawa told me that Honda was going to pull back their support. Uh, and that I should go ahead and move back to the five minutes or on. Wow. So, you know, I, I didn't argue with him. I just didn't right. understand it. But it was just, it was sad because you know, the whole team, everything worked really well. It would have just been great to come back again and try to win another championship uh, on, on your life. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just were just got together with Carl Fogarty out there for some photos. Is that is that how long has it been since you've seen him? Well, was the last race. Oh, really? So you've never seen him no, except when you raced him? him. And you had a lot of races with him. <laughs> yeah, a lot of races. But he was, the thing is about <clears throat> Carl, he's outspoken. That's just his personality. And uh, he's the there's nothing wrong with that. This is how he is. Um, but I, I just wished <clears throat> perhaps a little earlier in my career I'd have had more experience or perhaps maturity uh, because I could have used some of those things more to my advantage. Uh, but for me, I was like a you know a dog trained to, to fight. If somebody threw a jab, I was going to swing back before I'd even think. You yeah, know? and that's that's what uh, you know. I look back now and say, wow, I could have. Would even had to take a swing and could have used some things to my advantage. But in the end, I, I started to pick up on it. And like '97, I never got involved with any. You know, I just let him talk, and and I figured, you know what, I'll talk on Sunday. You know, one of the things about you, John, that I I I don't know, and I I will say, I mean, I do know a lot about you because I'm I've been a fan of yours forever. Is you came from Arkansas. I don't think of Arkansas, Arkansans or whatever you call them, being <laughs> motorcycle racers. How did that happen with you? How that's did you think? And I'll be, be honest with you, like, that's why I think part of the reason I had this sort of attitude, uh, because it was, it was hard, it was a struggle. You know, no one had no help, couldn't get any help. Uh, it's, and I was the only guy that, that rode motorcycles from Arkansas to ever make it. Did did you just like riding motorcycles when you were a kid and it went into racing? How did it yeah, how did like it start? That. You know, my father, you know, he he raced as an amateur. Um, never anything professional, just dirt track stuff. And that's how it started. You just, you know, hop on a bike and start riding around in the front yard and then it's, you know, let's make it a circle and learn how to slide a little bit, you know, and you know, from there it's like you find yourself doing wheelies down the street. <laughs> And it's, let's go to the local track and sign up for the first race kind of a thing and you know before you know it you're you're in it yeah and that's you didn't cool. just drive to california and show up at kenny's ranch right is that a no real story no that, that, that's a, people don't <clears throat> you know for me I, I guess i had this sort of way about me that you know that perhaps you know some people got rubbed the wrong way and it's simply because i had no help like i was the underdog and i was just fighting for everything you know, so that's that's what was you know really was a struggle. It was, it was tough. And when you look out here, and you'd see guys from California, um, 
you know, and they're, they either live next door to Kenny, you know, they, they knew all the people from champion frames, night frames, you know, they, they had all the best equipment, knew all the best people. And there was, I couldn't get any help, but yet I had to compete against these guys. Mm. So you, you were coming, you were, you didn't just be discovered, you were, weren't discovered all of a sudden by Kenny Roberts. You had no, done a lot no, to get to that not. point. I, I'm the one that, and I'll be honest, that's where, where Chuck became a big part of it because I'd met Chuck at some Chuck Axlin, yeah, at some yeah. national races. And uh, Chuck said, hey, you know, why don't you come out and we'll ride motocross bikes, you know? And I and I never asked him, I thought, wow, man, Chuck must have seen that I could ride fairly decent, you know, or thought, wow, man, this kid can, you know, do something. But he invited me out, I rode with him. Um, um, and uh, so then he said, hey, you know, at the, at the end of the year, you know, come back out or whatever, and I did. And, Chuck drove me to Kenny's ranch. Oh, wow. And uh, in a car. And it was from that point I'd met Kenny and, and I was like trying to sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, I wasn't going to accept no for an answer, but I was like, hey, you know, please give me a chance. Just get me a bike. You know, do something. Like help me. Yeah. But Kenny didn't discover me. Right. No. Yeah. He obviously helped you, but it wasn't. And that's the thing. No one helped me. No. What, what were those early days like at Kenny's? I mean, for a kid coming from Arkansas, was it were you was it intimidating to no, go? No, because see, the thing is, growing up as a kid, you know, I would go to Houston Astrodome, um, I, I, and I don't remember, but I, I do remember going there like in seventy three or seventy four. Went to the Dallas Stadium for the, the short track there. Kenny won that, so you know, I was a Kenny Roberts fan. Um, so going there it was like wow man it was like a dream you know being able to ride and, and, and you know as a kid that used to go to the races and watch him so it was like and that's the thing I was quite frankly I was talking to Wayne about yesterday is you know even Wayne and myself I mean, we grew up with peers people you looked up to but like Wayne said you know you, there were there were 50 you know flat track guys that were all good and there was a lot of folks you could look up to mm -hmm. that were really good and, and I'm not so sure that, that the guys today actually have those kind of peers to look up to why do you think that is? what do you think has changed? <laughs> well it's uh, you know this uh, it's, I think it's really hard to really put your finger on one thing but um as I as I mentioned previously, you know, a lot of a lot of your freedoms are under attack. Um, you know, discipline is pretty much eroded. I mean, even when you look at schools, you know, teachers if they, if they look at a child wrong, they're being sued or fired. Um, so, and and it's all about you know social media, and you see people now literally at a dinner table texting each other. <laughs> and, and they're just right across from each other. I was doing so that last night. I it's, think. <laughs> it's becoming so robotic in a way, and there's no human contact anymore. Right. You know, people don't talk to people. People don't call people up. It's just very narrowed down, and it's 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 like it's really hard to put your finger on one thing. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. But uh, uh, but back to that point, you know, going to his house or the ranch and riding was. Uh, man, it was, it was so much enthusiasm and excitement because it's like wow man this is something I've always dreamed about doing now you were you were well into racing obviously you'd won I think you won three cha three AMA 250 championships uh, 86 uh, 87, 88, and 89, I think. That's correct. And then you went and won the world championship in 1990. So in 1990, you went, uh, well, you were involved with Kenny prior to that, but you, you, the no, three. No, I was not involved with Kenny prior. Prior to 1990? <clears throat> no. The uh, Nordica? Prior to 87. Right. So what I'm saying is you had some, for three years in AMA, you were involved with Kenny, but then you go on to the world stage, and I know you did some 250 before that it, world championship. What I'm getting at is it was Eddie. Wayne and you and I've always referred to it as the dream team I think most people in America do you guys in those Marlboro team Robert, Robert's uh, you know leathers <coughs> some people called that the evil empire um, <laughs> talk about that and what was it like to be on that did you feel very proud to be on that team and to be oh, part of that absolutely no, it was, like you said it's everything that, especially Marlboro sponsorship you know I just remember looking back and 
I always thought they had the coolest looking bikes anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that marble orange color, and they, you could see them from anywhere on the track. Um, it was really like, to be on Marlboro bikes was, and I tell you, there was a couple, it was a year before that, actually, Agostini made an offer for me to come to Europe, and, and I I wanted to do it, you know, because that, just the Marlboro bikes were something, that, you know, that's like a, somebody offered me a Ferrari, you know, it's like, who's going to turn that down? Right. But, uh, but at the time, I had a manager, Gary Howard, and, and I think this is where maybe the more uh, the evil empire term may uh, ease into the, to the picture. Because Gary managed Wayne, Eddie, Kenny, myself. So you could imagine, you know, trying to negotiate helmet contracts. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, AGB, uh, Mr. Amazano, you know, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, that was AGB. He wanted me so bad to wear, and I wanted to wear their helmets bad. And um, and I liked them, and I thought, wow, because that's what Kenny wore was AGB, and that's what I wanted. Never happened. Mm. And um, I learned, uh, and then I remember when Wayne had signed with AGB, we knew something was, was something was strange with that because Amazon wanted me to. Be we were in negotiations with him hmm. and all of a sudden it just fell apart and Wayne signed with AGB. So it was, that was maybe perhaps those kind of things. And, and you can only imagine the, the conflict of interest when you have, you know, three guys that, that, uh, that you're managing and you have to put, right. You're going to find a place. Out. Right. It's, it's not easy. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about like your life since racing because John Kaczynski sort of just kind of, not went away, but kind of did go away. But I know you built a, a wonderful life for yourself. You have your son. Um, I know you uh, You speak so proudly of him and how well he does in school and how, you know, his athletic accomplishments and things like that. So tell us a little bit about, like, John Kaczynski's life now. Well, it's, you, you know, I, my life now is so different. Um, uh, and even when I finished racing, I went went off, took a few years off and just tried to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, I started developing real estate, you know, building um, big homes in the Beverly Hills area. And I um, was successful with it and did well. Um, so, so what I want people to know is I never would have had that chance if it wasn't for motorcycles and racing. And that put me on a level to where I could even think to go do what I have to do now. But, you know, unfortunately, when you're dealing with that type of sort of career, it doesn't really cross paths with motorcycle racing. And, and there's not a lot of motorcycle racers in Beverly Hills. So, you know, it was, um, it's what I did. And of course I went away. But my whole focus was, you know, I, I wanted to go do something different. You know, I could have perhaps hung on to Ray. What I, this is what I call like living off my own shirt tail. But that's not me. You know, I want to go out and do something different because, you know, just because you race motorcycles doesn't mean you don't have a mind for, to do other things well. Right. And I think I proved that. Mm -hmm. So uh, so now, you know, it's been over 20 years since I've been to the event and I'm here and to come, and to come back and, and to see it. It, it feels great to be here and see the people and everything like that. So, so my mindset about the racing is without the racing, I could have never been do what I do today. And of course, you know, having my young son, John, is good. You know, that's like a dream and to watch him grow and try to teach him. And hopefully you know, he's going to find you know, what he likes to do and I can assist him in trying to do, do it as well as possible. So. John, that's a good question. I I have a son, 24, went through a time where I tried him on motorcycles. He had really no interest in it. So, you know, he's a graphic design art type kid, you know, he loves that, has a passion for it. These fa these fathers who raced or fathers that have kids who race, you you just kind of said you're not pushing John into racing. It's what he wants to do. Are you do you see him? <clears throat> with motorcycles or well for me right now it's just about give it's just about 
and we're going to try to lay out as many things out there on the table as possible mm-hmm. and then let him go and figure out you know which one he likes more which one he wants to try to do I'm not going to tell him what to do he's his own individual and, and there are many people that think that's a crazy way of thinking because he's seven or eight years old or nine years old what do you mean you gonna let him well but that's the truth yeah he has the, that freedom I'm not going to push him in any direction or, or be like a helicopter parent you know I, I we have standards and we have things that we do and we have to work hard for the things we get but from there it's just the, you know I want to expose him to the world so it's interesting because what you said earlier in this podcast is you didn't don't like to live by parameters or didn't like to live by parameters you're teaching your son they're well, it's not, the same thing it is I, I'm I'm of the mindset you know, don't ask someone to do something you can't do and that's the thing yeah so I wouldn't like that and, and but, I, but if you open the doors I believe that you and you put them out there with the right discipline that I think good things can will happen and that's cool so that's all you can do with the real estate stuff when you jumped into that did you just you didn't know a lot about it and you just taught yourself or did you have was there a mentor or somebody there's no, somebody that you that's found? the thing I, I know that actually Wayne asked me that question he goes oh, how did you and it's like no again I've had no help no one helps me I'm on my own and I was just I just drove around in my car and, and I educate myself with my eyes <laughs> and the first thing that I'd done you know, it was huge so I mean I, I, I haven't done had anything happen that wasn't quite big so no, no failures yeah that's pretty amazing and I, and I tell you for one thing for me it's like that I'm happy to you know it's like wow you maybe touch wood or something but uh, if I had to say my biggest failure in real estate you know made me a lot of money so I, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that can't be that yeah that's not bad I'm okay with that so but now I'm kind of at a point what? you know I believe everything has a shelf life and you know careers do and, and I've done this now for you know a little more than 10 years and you know, perhaps now, especially with John, my young son John, you know, might be looking to make another change to you know, try something else. So what, what might that be? I, you know, I don't know yet. Okay. I, I don't know. It was just like when I when I left racing. You know, I it, it took a few years to figure it out. Um, but uh, but whatever it is, I just don't want to do it well. Well, it sounds like some of it might be to kind of go back to your roots with racing a little bit. You know. I enjoy training. I enjoy taking care of myself. I enjoy teaching uh, my son, John, about how important conditioning is, the way you eat, uh, take care of yourself. Um, yeah, that's important. But yeah, you know, riding is something that, um, you know, I, and from time to time when I have a chance, I do ride some flat track stuff that I really enjoy. Um, but yeah, it's it'd be fun to come back and, and play around with some uh, motorcycle thing. Oh, yeah. It really would, but like I say, right now I don't have the answer. But it's you know, I'm not sure yet. But it's nice to have uh, choices. Have you been on a road race bike at all? No, I like no track days or nothing. But I've only ridden my short trackers and skateboards. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I don't think it'd be. It wouldn't take it's like riding a bike. It wouldn't take too long to get back into the groove of it. You know, it's it's. Uh, um, what, now I don't know if people know this about you, but from I've never talked to you about this, but John is an amazingly good water skier. Do you still do it? I haven't done it in a few years, uh, just because you know when my son was born. Uh, you know, that's the thing about life now for me is it's I have a I have a hard time focusing on a lot of things because I, well when I do things I like to do them so well that it takes so much. Kind of you basically have to dedicate your life to it. And that's what I've done. You know, when I went into real estate, I just dedicated my life to it. That's all I thought about, and lived, and, and you know, now with him. It's, uh, and I tell you, the strange thing is, there's anybody that's, that's, that's had kids understands this, but and they bring home their, their second, third grade math, and there's sometimes things on there that you have to really think about. Oh, yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's like I'm going to school. It is. Yeah, you're going to school with them. Exactly. When you have to start looking things up on the internet, how to do it, it's like, man, this is only fourth grade level. Like, what's wrong with this picture? You know, so it's... But I tell you one thing about having a child is, is people talk about how much work it is and, and, and all this drama and, and maybe I was just blessed with a great kid because I haven't found any of it to be work. It's been, I mean, I enjoy doing the things, you know, just the basic, keeping his clothes clean, brushing his teeth, right. you know, taking him to the doctor. I mean, all the things that, you, that I think that most folks would, would, would refer to as the grind. I, I just, I love doing it. I love taking care of him. And so we're just having so much fun and I'm, and I'm waiting for this moment almost to, that all hell's going to break loose because that's how everybody says it's going to be. Right. <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, like us all, you know, when we get 18 years old or 17 years old, at some point we know more than than the world. And, and, and I know he's probably going to go on his way. Uh, but but that's life. Do you see yourself in him? Does he is he you when you were younger? Mm. Yeah, I no, because he can do the fourth grade math. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is that. There is, this. I, I, there is that. <laughs> he's showing me how to do it. No, I just know that. Uh, I don't really think about that. Okay, quite honestly, but I will say. Uh, <clears throat> Because of my current situation uh, and having to uh, uh, deal with, learn about, you know, psychology and the forensic side of things, that uh, I had a forensic psychologist tell me that he was cut from the same cloth. Yeah, uh, it, genetics are—it's you can't deny it. It's unbelievable. And it's it, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is you never know when you have a child. You just never know what that combination is going to bring. Right. And, well, you can have two or three kids, and they're also different. So radically different, the same yeah. parents. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, all I, I'm happy and, and and because the way I am as an individual, just wanting to go all in to want to do something. I and I thought that before I thought I would could never be a parent. You know, I thought I'd be a horrible dad. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't have the patience and things of that nature. But wow, you know, I, I discovered that I had a talent that I never knew that I had. You know, That's I, great. I, because I'm enjoying it so much. And, and a lot of people think, you know, just because your kids are in the same vicinity, you're spending time with them. But that's not true. Right. And and for me, even though, like, I know he's over there, and he knows I'm paying attention to him. Yeah. So we're, 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 the thing is, it's about having a connection with your child at all times. And like we were over the Yoshimura tent, and I was talking to a fella, and he was riding his bicycle. And he saw me look away. It's because I, I, I felt something to look for him. So he knows. Yeah. He knows that he's out there riding, but his dad is, he's not lost contact with his dad. Right. So, so I think that's a, a component that you don't see a lot of because either A, someone else is looking after their kids or they're just totally disconnected. Or, you know, the last one is they're on their phone. Right. You know, texting with their buddies or whatever. Right. So... Yeah. So like you say, it's um, you, you only get one shot at this, and and, and, and it doesn't and, last long. Either. Well, and I will say, quick. for me, I look at it like you know, the ultimate judgment day is going to be the day he turns eighteen, he walks out that door. You know, he's either going to sink or he's going to fly like an airplane. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping it's 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 the latter. Yeah. So I think that's the point where you realize what sort of job he did. All this in between is irrelevant. It's just like races, you know, what matters is who's champion. Yep. No, I mean, I'm an old guy now, but honestly, when I look back and I'm most proud of how my, how my kids turned out more so than any job I did, Yeah, or, you know, right. how great cycle news was or wasn't or whatever. What, what's important to me is my, my kids have turned out to be two great adults. Well, think about it. Imagine having a child and, and everything goes south and you right. have to live with that yeah. your whole life and people you know, making comments about it and things like that. I mean, you can know, look at it from many different angles, but, but just that aspect alone, just as for you to see your own child not do well, must be, uh, yeah. I mean, that must, uh, I couldn't imagine it. You know, that's why I'm, I'm gonna give it all I got. Yeah. Know? And uh, But for me, like with anything, if you lay it all on the line and you, and you literally hang it out to the wind and you fail, you're not happy you failed. But you tried as hard as you could, so you have nothing to be ashamed of. 
So it's just like this, you know, I'm throwing every caution to the wind. I'm gonna give it all I got, you know, to do the best I can with him. But the end result, I can't control it. Right. Um, um, so throwing caution to the wind, you're gonna get that TZ 250 ready for us? And <clears throat> well, I, I will say one thing. Um, back when I raced, you know, engineers would come up with new, you know, new parts and pieces and put them on, you'd go out and come in and tell them how terrible it was <laughs> yeah. or how great it was. Um, I look back and I tell you now that I actually have taken on a task and, and built a lot of my own parts and, and had to design them and go through the process. I, I look back and go, wow, I have so much respect for those engineers now. And, I, and, if, and, if, and if I ever told one, that something was terrible, you know, I'd like to apologize to all of them. <laughs> That's not easy. It's not easy. And it's so when you say get this thing running, it's, yeah. we're making so many parts and pieces that are our own stuff and having to do things that no one's ever done. And it's a real undertaking. And to be honest with you, I've, I've often thought like, well, what have I gotten myself into? But once you step off that cliff, the free fall begins yeah so you're in it yep so it's it's that's what this is we're we're wide open and and, and i want to you know get it together you know i'm very excited about it because it was actually a motorcycle growing up as a kid that i could never afford to have and uh i just looked up the people that had them yeah and uh, believe it or not chuck was one of them chuck yeah. had one <laughs> chuck had one hmm. yeah it's great I can't wait to see what you do next, John. Well, you know, we're, like you say, it's all about using your mind, trying to be creative, trying to come up with things and do things. Like you said, you know, if you're going to do something, you know, even when I went to a, a short track race, you know, like, 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 you know, when I go, you know, I'm, I look at myself like what flat track people are you know most of the fans are just regular folks that, that uh, just like I am from middle America so when I go I always like to go with, with a special presentation to really give those people something let them know how much I appreciate them right so like this project is, it'll be something quite extraordinary it, it's not uh, uh, not going to be your basic run of the mill motorcycle well let's uh, I can wrap it up let's wrap it up with that and We'll get back to watching some races. Cool. Yeah. It's nice to have you back. No, no, back. Thank, thank you guys very much Thanks, for your John. time. And thank you. Like I said, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm very excited. Awesome. Thank you. It's great.